Hey guys, how are you all doing? Welcome to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Naruto finds the body of Ichiha Shusui and is attacked by Itachi, part 1. So before we start, go check out the author of this fanfic, Nightblade888, link is in the description. Also subscribe if you enjoy the video, let's start the story. A 7-year-old Uzumaki Naruto was walking around the outskirts of Konoha. The blonde boy, who was wearing a white shirt with an orange spiral on it, along with a pair of dark blue shorts, as well as three strange whisker-like marks on his cheeks, had just pulled his greatest prank to date, releasing a bunch of harmless garter snakes into the girls' bathrooms at school. Of course Iruka-sensei had caught him, and he was punished, but he didn't care. At least he was getting some acknowledgement, although he didn't like the idea of being known solely for his pranks. Out of the corner of his eye, Naruto saw a dark-clad figure lying on the ground in the warm weather, and a light breeze that made the leaves of the trees rustle in a kind of exasperated way. His mouth twisted into a grin at the fun he could have with the sleeping figure. Naruto crept silently towards the slumbering figure, pen in hand, ready to draw all over the unsuspecting victim. However, when he reached the side of the soon-to-be victim of his prank, he noticed that the man was staring at him with a blank look in his eyes. Naruto froze when he saw this, and started to mumble an apology to the man. Ah, sorry, I was just yeah, I'm sorry. No hard feelings right? The boy asked the man, not making eye contact. When he heard no response, he looked at the man, expecting to see the cold fury that people always have on their faces after his jokes. Instead, the man was lying on the ground in exactly the same position he had been when Naruto first saw him. What is he, sleeping with his eyes open? Naruto thought, a sweat drop forming on the back of his head. Still searching for a prank to pull, Naruto settled for the kick someone in the ribs and run away gag. An oldie, but a goodie. Naruto drew his leg back and delivered the hardest kick a seven-year-old could manage. He expected the man to get up and chase him, but instead he simply lay there. Once again walking over to the prone figure, Naruto looked at the man's face, only to notice that it was turning slightly blue. In a moment of clarity, Naruto realized that the figure wasn't sleeping. He was dead. Shocked at his newfound discovery, Naruto turned around to run away, only to find his path blocked by another figure, this one in an Anbu uniform. Naruto was frightened right then, he normally got blamed for things he didn't do, and this was something he didn't do. Hell, he didn't even know what happened, other than he found the guy dead. I it isn't what it looks like. He exclaimed quickly, I just found him. I know exactly what it looks like. The Anbu said, walking over to the body. Naruto could see that the shinobi had dark black hair, much like the dead man had. Ichiha Shusui appears to have been suffocated or drowned. Killed by Ichiha Itachi. The masked ninja replied. That's awesome, how you can tell that just by looking at a dead body. Naruto exclaimed, glad that he wasn't being blamed for the death of the man. How do you do that? There was a pause for a moment as the Anbu turned and looked at Naruto, his eyes turning from black to red, with three odd marks circling his pupils. Because I am Itachi. He started calmly. Now that you have seen this, I cannot let you live. He said, as he drew his sword. Naruto turned to run, but was stopped when the cold metal of an Anbu sword cut through his stomach. The sword was quickly removed before it was once again slid through his body. Naruto let out a scream, only to find it muffled by the hand of the Anbu. As Naruto slid to the ground he was rolled over. Before he lost consciousness, he saw the ninja take out a kunai. Then everything went black. The next thing that Naruto knew, he was lying in a bed in a hospital. However, having never been hospitalized before, he didn't know where he was. He tried to open his eyes, but found that he was stopped by something covering them. Reaching up to touch his eyes, he felt the coarse, but soft texture of gauze. Suddenly he was racked with a fit of pain, as the adrenaline of his awakening wore off. He groaned and winced in pain, it wasn't until someone spoke up that he realized someone was in the room. Naruto-kun, it is good to see you are awake. Said Siratobi, the Sandame Hokage. Uh, Oji-san, what happened? Naruto managed to groan out while he winced. It would seem that you were attacked by Ichiha Itachi and thrown in the river, left for dead. Sandame said. You were found floating in the river along with the body of Ichiha Shisui by an old student of mine, and she brought you both back. Hey, old man, what's with my eyes? Naruto interrupted the venerable Hokage. Although he couldn't see it, the Hokage cringed before he answered. I was about to explain that. It seems that for whatever reason, Itachi damaged your eyes beyond our healing abilities. This elicited a gasp of shock from Naruto. Does this mean I'm blind? He asked through gasps of breath. He began to cry at the prospect of never being able to see again. Actually, far from it. The old man said. My former student is a very good medic nin, and she was able to transplant Shisui's eyes into you. It is very rare indeed, but it was vital to your survival that every place that blood could leak out from was plugged. That included your eyes. 
You, I have some dead guy's eyes in my head. Naruto yelled. Yes Naruto-kun I suppose you do. The old man chuckled. Naruto, those eyes are very special, they hold the bloodline limit of the Achiha clan. What's a bloodline limit? Asked Naruto. It's a special ability that is passed down through someone's family. Explained the gray man. Now, since you are not an Achiha, I do not think that the limit will awaken in your eyes, but that doesn't mean that they aren't valuable. If someone were to take them, Kanoha would be in very big trouble. Naruto just lay in bed digesting all of the new information he had just learned. Old man, how long was I out for? Did anything important happen? He asked. To answer your first question, you were unconscious for about two weeks. Now, Naruto, the second thing is pretty bad. Itachi, the man that attacked you, he murdered his entire family except for his little brother, Sasuke. Saratobi said in a sad voice. This means that there are only four people left in the world with the same kinds of eyes you have. Naruto just sat there in silence. He didn't know what to do, he was only seven crying out loud, and he just found out that he had some dead guy's eyes in his head, and the dead guy's family was dead, except for one kid. This day just couldn't get any weirder. Oh how wrong he was. After checking up on Naruto, Saratobi made his way back to his office, he had a meeting to conduct with someone, and it wasn't going to be good. As he entered his office, he saw his old student, Sunade, waiting for him. She was holding a standard medical file, with all of the information they could gain from Naruto while he was unconscious. Everything seems to be fine, Saratobi sensei The blonde woman said. There is one interesting thing. You said he was an orphan, right? The Sandane just nodded. Well, I ran a DNA test with some extra blood samples we had, and well, you should look at them yourself. She handed the old man the folder. When he opened it he stared at a complete genetic profile of the blonde. However, what grabbed his attention was the report that Tsunade had written up. Who else has seen this? He demanded. Only Shizun and I have seen the report. She stated, calmly. Tsuritobi began to massage his temples as he felt a migraine coming on. Do you know how this could have happened? She asked. I have an idea, although I shudder to think of how she'll take this. Saratobi said. He pressed a button on his intercom and waited for his secretary to respond. I need you to have Mitarashi Anko meet me as soon as possible. He ordered. The aforementioned was currently training out at Field 38. Mitarashi Anko was a Kanoichi known for her short temper, more than slightly sadistic nature, lack of proper clothing, and her prowess with kunai knives. She was a little annoyed that he was pulling her away from her training, but she needed a short break anyway. Her brown trench coat didn't move at all, as she made her way up the winding stairs. When she entered his office, she was greeted by the sight of the old man, as well as Tsunade, the legendary medic. You wanted to see me Hokage-sama? She asked, a look of slight confusion passing through her brown eyes. Yes, as you know, Ichiha Itachi attacked and killed his best friend, as well as a small boy a couple weeks ago. Tsunade ran a blood test to look for any possible relatives. Anko didn't like where this was going. There were only two reasons why he would call her in to discuss this kind of situation. Anko, the Sandame said, breaking her train of thought. We have good reason to believe that it's him. Anko's eyes grew wide at those words, and she collapsed into a chair, grasping her breath and shaking her purple-tinted hair in such a manner, as if to knock loose a certain memory. Tsunade thought this was strange, even for Anko, who was known for her loud entrances and more than slightly sadistic nature. What do you mean to him? She questioned. What in the hell is going on? Saratobi sighed at the question of his student. During the Kaiubi attack, there were many S-class secrets made, one of which was Anko's pregnancy. He stated. What do you mean, pregnant, she's only 24, that would make her 17, at the time, I know that's rather young, but that's not exactly worthy of such secrecy. Tsunade said, angry that she was left out of the loop. You know who Anko sensei was, don't you? Saratobi asked, rubbing his head. You know what he did? Of course Tsunade knew this, Anko sensei was Arachimaru, her former teammate turned missing nin. He was wanted for experimenting on humans, but she didn't see what that had to do with. Oh, my god. Tsunade gasped, looking at the slouched figure resting in a chair, her hands grabbing her stomach. Yes, due to one of Arachimaru's experiments, Anko hasn't aged in over seven years. Saratobi said, trying to comfort the sobbing women in his office. And due to another of his experiments, she found she was pregnant. We think it was part of an experiment to create a new bloodline limit. So, you're saying that my baby is alive? Anko asked, through ragged breaths. Why? Why did you lie to me then? She demanded. Anko, I had no intention of lying to you about this, when I found your son, there was no evidence that he was related to you in any way, and due to the damage of the Kaiubi, we just assumed that your son was dead. I'm very sorry about this. I want to see him, right now. Anko demanded. 
There's no way that I'm leaving him now, who knows what he's going through because of me. Of course Anko, but before that, I have a few other things I want to discuss with you first. The instructions. Alright, but can you at least tell me his name? She said. His name is Uzumaki Naruto. The third replied, watching her reaction. Anko's face was a mixture of emotions. Happy and sad were interchanged with anger and fury. She was grateful for the chance to be a part of her son's life, sad that he had been hospitalized in critical condition for the past two weeks, and angry at the villagers, who were too ignorant to see that the boy, her son, wasn't the demon that was sealed into him. Anko, in the DNA results, Sunade found some very interesting information. It seems that Naruto has a large number of genetic markers, in common with the Yandame. This elicited a loud gasp from Tsunade and a blank look from Anko. Are you saying that the father of my son is Yandame? She questioned. No, I'm not. You see, during his assault, Itachi damaged his eyes so badly that they had to be removed. When Tsunade found him, she had to transplant the eyes of Ichiha Shisui to stem the large amount of blood loss he was experiencing. I don't see why that is important, Kakashi has a Sharingan implanted in his head too. Anko growled. Yes, but Kakashi hasn't suddenly developed Ichiha genes. The third replied. What do you mean by Ichiha genes? Anko questioned. Hear me out, when your son was born, he had darker hair right? The third question. Yes, dark hair, and my eyes. Anko said. After the Kaiubi was sealed, the boy I found had blonde hair and blue eyes. Just like Yandame. In fact, he looks exactly like Yandame did at his age. Now, with the Achiha genes, his hair is still blonde, but with black streak in it, and his eyes are going to be black. His DNA shares markers identical to Shisui, as well as the Yandame. What I think happened, was that Orochimaru succeeded in creating a bloodline that would absorb anything foreign that the body was subjected to, into the DNA. That way, any descendants of the child would bear the traits, as well. Sandame concluded. I think that before my successor died, he may have transferred, either by accident or intentionally, some of his DNA into Naruto, giving him his former appearance. Wait, what about Kaiubi, does that mean that he is part demon or something? Tsunade asked, shocked at her sensei's analytical analysis of Naruto's abilities. My son isn't a demon. Anko said, loudly, glaring at the. Calm down you two. The Sandame said. If I am correct, Naruto must be subjected to someone's DNA to change. Since the Kaiubi is sealed inside of him, then there is no fear of him becoming a demon, besides, we have a full DNA right up. He's 100% human. But, what's to stop someone from putting their blood into him? He'll keep on changing, and that won't be good. Anko worried that her son may end up with some kind of disorder before she got to know him. Well, for one, since Kaiubi is healing him, it is safe to assume that the demon has some ability to regulate what is absorbed, and what isn't. If he didn't have the Kaiubi, then I shudder to think what would happen. Saratobi said. I believe that the ability is either fading or slowing down completely because he adopted the genes of the fourth within a matter of minutes, but this time it took almost the entire two weeks he was unconscious for the changes to occur. Do you have those reports, Sunade? Hi, his DNA had been slowly changing over the period of the past two weeks, and the changes were mostly minimal. I would need to run more tests, but I think that this ability is either being overwritten in his own DNA, or it is being stopped, as to prevent further damage to the boy. The medic nin deduced. Now, said the third Hokage, what do you say about meeting your son? Tsunade, Anko, and the Hokage made their way back to Naruto's hospital room. Anko was more than a bit nervous about meeting her son that she didn't know survived the Kaiubi attack, for the first time. She was surprised that the Hokage had allowed her to regain custody of Naruto, since she was a former apprentice of Orochimaru, plus her son was the Kaiubi vessel. She had no doubt that life would be rough for the two, at least for a while. As the trio entered the room, they found the blonde asleep in the overly large bed, making his already malnourished frame seem even smaller. Anko let out a sob, seeing her son in his present condition. She quickly rushed to his side and held his sleeping form in her arms. Seeing mother and son reunited in such a fashion made both the Hokage and Tsunade smile. Tsunade went to check on his charts to see how he was progressing. After reading the clipboard attached to the end of the bed, her face fell into a frown, and she motioned for Saratobi to follow her into the hallway. Sensei, no one has checked up on the boy since I finished with him, except for me and Shizun. Isn't there one doctor here who doesn't see him as the demon? She asked, showing her anger. The Sandame let out a sigh and frowned. I was unaware that the staff harbored such a grudge against Naruto, of course this is his first time in the hospital, so I really had no previous knowledge of the staff's reaction. He said. Tsunade's scowl deepened as she heard two idiot nurses complaining about the demon brat. Tsunade, I have a request for you. Saratobi said. 
I know that you have lost a lot of faith in this village, but I want you to come back. I would like you to be able to check on Naruto, since you are the only medic nin, not beast against him. If you don't want to take on the role of a ninja again, would you at least consider running the hospital? Tsunade stared at him with a glint of anger in her eyes. I'm sorry sensei, but that's not happening anytime soon. I'll stay until Naruto is well enough to leave with his mom, but after that I'm leaving again. She said, suddenly a look of compassion washed over her young looking face. But, I will stop by a couple times a year to check on him, and to make sure that his bloodline isn't acting up. Tsuritobi just nodded, and headed towards the room of Ichiha Sasuke. Sasuke was lying in his bed, depressed after witnessing the brutal murder of his parents at the hands of his older brother, who had then used the Tsukiyomi, Moon Reader, which forced the eight-year-old to relive the murder of his entire clan for three days. Right now the black-haired, black-eyed boy was laying on his side, staring out the window. How are you today, Sasuke-kun? Asked the old man. The boy simply looked over at him, but didn't say anything, he simply rolled back over, and resumed moping. Saratobi was greatly saddened by this turn of events, as the last remaining Ichiha that was loyal to Konoha, he was important to the survival of the Sharingan bloodline. Although, now that Naruto had incorporated it into his own DNA, there were now two people who could pass it on to their children. Sasuke, the Hokage started there is someone I want you to meet. Naruto woke to find himself in a dark, damp, creepy hallway, with pipes and a faint glow at the end of the hallway. Feeling an irresistible urge to follow, Naruto headed towards the light. When he arrived, he found himself facing a large gate, with a simple piece of paper stuck to the front of it that said seal. Suddenly a large pair of blood-red eyes, with black slit pupils leered at the small boy. The first thing that ran through Naruto's mind was, what the hell followed closely by an audible what the hell, I can see again. Brad, that's because you aren't in the conscious world yet. You're in your mind. A deep voice echoed through the cavernous hallway. Who are you? Asked Naruto, staring into the red eyes without blinking. I am the great Kai Ubi. The voice rang out. Hey, but you're dead, how can you be in my head? I must be dreaming. Naruto yelled, and then muttered. Okay, I'll cut back from five bowls of ramen before bed to four. I am most certainly not dead. Kaiubi retorted. I was sealed inside of you by the one you call Yandame. I am doomed to stay trapped in here until you die, thus taking me with you to the afterlife. Wait, you're sealed inside of me. Naruto's voice was full of shock and surprise. If this was the great demon that attacked Konoha, then that would explain why people always said mean things to him. You. You're the reason that everyone hates me. Aren't you? You're the reason that no one will help me, and no one will let their kids play with me. You're the reason that I don't have any family. The boy screamed, tears beginning to flow from his eyes. Upon seeing the boy, who had stood up to more hardships in his short seven years of life than most people did in a lifetime, Kaiubi's eyes began to cry and couldn't help but soften a bit. Yeah, kid, I'm the reason that everyone hates you. I'm the reason that they keep their offspring away from you. But I think you'll find that you are mistaken, I had nothing to do with your lack of family. The deep bass voice of the legendary fox rang out. What do you mean, I don't have a family, no one loves me enough to give me one. Naruto yelled. But suddenly, the cage began to dissolve around him, along with the background, and Naruto slowly felt himself wake up. Tsuritobi and Sasuke entered a room to see a woman who had dark hair that almost looks purple, holding a boy with blonde hair and bandages over his eyes. Both were sleeping, the woman holding the blonde to her chin. That is Uzumaki Naruto, the bandages are from where your brother attacked him and hacked at his eyes. At this, Sasuke looked shocked, he knew that his brother was deranged, but hacking out the eyes of a child was wrong, even for a homicidal maniac. To save his life, a student of mine transplanted the eyes of one of your clansmen into Naruto. He'll have the Sharingan, and due to his bloodline limit, he will be able to pass it on to his children. The third explained. Okage-sama, why are you doing this? Sasuke asked. The third smiled at the young Ichiha. Naruto is, or rather, was an orphan. The woman you see with him is his biological mother, since Naruto was born during the Kaiubi attack, records were messed up, and they were separated. I thought that since the two of you share the same bloodline, that we should keep you two together, that is, if you would like to. The third explained. Do you mean, live with them? Sasuke asked, with a hint of joy in his voice. If you want to, then yes, Anko is A, so she has many difficult missions that may last a long time. If you were to join them, she wouldn't have to worry about Naruto while she was away. The third explained. I would like that a lot, if they would have me. Sasuke said, after only a few seconds of thought. Sandame just smiled and walked the boy back to his room. He would talk with Anko and Naruto about this later. If she refused, he could always make it a mission. Naruto could feel someone's arms around his shoulders in an embrace he was unfamiliar with. 
This wasn't some villager trying to kill him, there wasn't any pressure on his neck. This felt almost good. But no one loved him, maybe it was the Hokage. Naruto shifted a bit, letting out a quiet groan from his stiff back muscles. He felt the person who was holding him recoil, and gasped. I knew it, another person who hates me. Naruto thought. Suddenly the arms appeared again, this time in a full-fledged hug. Naruto heard the mystery person, sobbing on his shoulder, as they hugged him. Naruto normally would have pushed this person away, but something about the hug caught him off guard. He was too stunned to ask a question, although he quickly recuperated and was about to ask one, when he heard the door open, followed by a number of footsteps, and the protective arms of the mystery person retracted. Making up for lost time, A, eh, Anko? The voice of the Hokage asked. Huh? Old man, who is this? Naruto asked, jabbing his thumb to his right, in what he hoped was the direction of the mysterious Anko. Naruto felt a hand encircle his, as the mysterious person spoke. Naruto, I'm Anko, choked on her words, and couldn't finish them. Naruto, this is your mother, Midarashi Anko. The Hokage said. What? I don't have a mom, you said so yourself. Naruto cried. I know Naruto, but I was wrong. There are a few things I want to talk about, the first being your history. Said Siratobi. Wait, is this about Kaiubi? Naruto asked. This completely shocked the two occupants in the room. How do you know about the Kaiubi? Asked the Hokage. I was just talking with the great big fuzzball. He told me about how the Yandame sealed him inside of me, and how he was the reason the villagers hate me. Naruto replied. It is true that the Yandame sealed the Kaiubi in you to save the village, but that's not the only thing I wanted to talk with you about. Said the Sandame. Naruto, well you were unconscious, we ran some blood tests to try and find your parents, and it turns out that Enko is your mother. We also found out that you have a very unique bloodline limit, it allows you to absorb people's DNA into your own, you see when you were born, you had much darker hair and brown eyes, but somehow, some of the Yandame's DNA got into you, which is why you look almost exactly like him. The Hokage said. Naruto just looked shocked, but since his eyes were still held shut, he couldn't stare in the correct direction. The Sandium continued. Tsunade thinks that your bandages can come off in a day, so we will keep you here for the night. Now, I think that you should get to know your mother better. Without warning, Siratobi left the two in the room alone, one just happy to know her child was alive, the other digesting the insane amount of information that was just leveled at him. While the two sat in awkward silence, Anko's hand snaked onto Naruto's head and began to stroke his hair. Akasan, Gasped Naruto at the unfamiliar contact. Hi, Naruto-kun, I'm your Kasan. Anko said, trying to hold back tears. I missed you, Akasan. Yawned Naruto, snuggling into the unfamiliar warmth of his mother, and fell asleep. Anko didn't say anything. She just hugged her son tighter, her tears falling freely again. As the sun crept ever lower in the western sky, Anko moved Naruto into a more comfortable position in his bed and made her way into the hallway. She was hungry and headed towards the vending machine at the end of the hallway. She suddenly felt a presence spying on her from her right and looked over her shoulder at the offending person. She saw the Achiha survivor looking at her from his room, saying goodbye to the Hokage. As she turned her attention back to her previous task, she felt the old Hokage come up behind her. Hokage-sama, I, I want to thank you for allowing me to get my son back, most of the village would like nothing more than for him to be dead, but I can't. I won't let that happen now. Anko said, in an unusually demure voice. Think nothing of it, Anko. I wouldn't have it any other way. If anyone deserves a family it is that boy above all others. Siratobi said. Actually, I have a question to ask of you. I know that motherhood will be a new experience for you, but I would like to keep the Sharingan bloodline together as much as possible. Naruto will hopefully brighten Sasuke's disposition, and Sasuke may be able to calm your son down a bit. You're asking me to adopt the Achiha. Asked Anko, she was shocked that she was being asked to guard possibly the most important bloodline in the entire village. Yes, Sasuke has already expressed his wish to live with the two of you, should you wish to take him in. I'm afraid for him, you see, not only did Itachi murder his parents in front of his eyes, he's done it and caused the boy some serious mental trauma. I'm afraid of what would happen to him if he was left alone. All he seems to do is brood, but when I mentioned the possibility of a new family, his eyes picked up immediately. Siratobi explained. I'm honored, Hokage-sama, but I'd have to talk with Naruto first. Anko said. Of course. Said the Sandame. Would you at least like to meet him? He asked. Anko removed her purchase from the machine and nodded her head. Well then, I'll bring him by tomorrow when Naruto gets his bandages off. Siratobi said and left the hallway. Anko simply returned to her son's room to dream about life with a new family. The morning sun rose and with it, Anko's eyelids. 
As she rubbed the sleep from her eyes, she looked at the sleeping form of her son. His blonde hair was streaked with lines of Ichiha black, and the new jeans had even given his normally unruly hair a bit of a lean, causing the hairs on the top of his head to lean towards his arms, although it was slight. The whisker marks which adorned his cheeks seemed to fade with the incorporation of his new jeans, but that might be a good thing. The less people recognized him, the better it would be. The sleeping boy was awoken around 9 o'clock by the entrance of the Sandame Hokage, as well as the remaining Ichiha survivor. Once Tsunade gets here, we will be able to remove the bandages. The old man explained. While the group was waiting, Naruto had tried to start up a conversation with Sasuke. He knew the boy from the academy, but that was as far as his knowledge went. Though it wasn't known to Naruto, Sasuke was doing the same thing. He wanted to find out all he could about his new brother. What he knew from the academy was limited, and it failed to do the blonde justice. Sasuke knew that Naruto had a reputation as being the dumbest boy in the class who liked to play jokes and was very loud. But after talking with him, he realized that Naruto, for all his apparent shortcomings, was actually quite smart. Thinking over his short experience with the boy, he realized that most of the questions Naruto received and subsequently failed were much too hard for most to answer. Actually, Sasuke didn't even know the answer to the questions the dope received. Sasuke came to the conclusion that Naruto's lack of skill was due to his lack of a family. He hadn't had anyone to teach him any techniques or how to control his chakra. He had grown up alone, without the benefits or joys that family brings. The black-haired boy's next thought caught him off guard. If Naruto had never been trained, then how good would he be with supervision? While Naruto was the dead last at the academy, it wasn't by much. He might even be a worthy challenge for Sasuke, maybe even better than the Achiha. The thought of this made the Achiha smile. The boy's conversation was interrupted by the arrival of Tsunade and her apprentice, Shizune, who would be departing the hidden village immediately following Naruto's dismissal from the hospital. She muttered something about a hangover and proceeded to unwrap the bandages surrounding Naruto's head. After the last bit of gauze was removed, Naruto slowly opened his eyes. At first the unusual sensation of bright light hitting eyes stung for a while, but slowly they grew accustomed. The crowd in the room was looking at the boy expectantly, waiting to hear his reaction. Sasuke immediately saw the Achiha eyes and noted with happiness that the boy looked almost like an Achiha, with his darkly streaked hair and deep black eyes. He was happy that even if the person staring back at him wasn't a true Achiha, that he had at least found someone who was like him. Naruto was just happy to have his sight back, he blinked a few times before taking note of the people in the room. He recognized the Hokage and Sasuke. But there were three new people in his room that he had never seen before, including his mother. Naruto looked over his shoulder at the purple-haired and stared into her brown eyes. Although he looked nothing like her, he knew instinctively that she was his mother. Asan. The boy cried and quickly enveloped Anko in a fierce hug. How do the eyes feel? She asked, returning the hug. They feel fine. The boy replied. Can I see what they look like? Tsunade pointed her thumb over towards a small mirror over the sink in a corner. Naruto leaped out of bed and quickly made his way over to the sink to check out his new appearance. The black eyes of Ichiha Shisui gazed back at the former blonde. The look seemed almost natural. The only sign that the eyes were transplanted were small scars around the corners of his eyes, where the originals had been removed. The left eye had a cross running downward towards the bridge of his nose, and the right eye had two scars forming a cross at the far corner. All in all, Naruto liked his new look, the eyes weren't his usual happy blue, but he liked them nonetheless. His hair was now streaked and more limp than before made him look a bit more mysterious, seeing as it actually hid some of his face. However, the thing he was most happy about was the fact that those ugly whisker marks had faded. Where there were once three lines, only two remained, making him look less like the fox that was trapped inside him. This is so cool. Naruto said, responding to his new look. I'm glad to hear that you like your new look, Naruto. Sandame said. I have a question for you, I want to know how you would feel, having Sasuke as your brother. You mean, since he's an orphan too, you want him to live with Kasan and me? The seven-year-old asked. Sandane chuckled to himself, seeing how intelligent Naruto could be. Yes, I would like for your mother and you to adopt Sasuke, so that all of you can have a family, even after such tragic events. That would be so cool. What do you think about Kasan? The loudmouth asked, heading back to be closer to his mother. I don't mind, as long as you don't. Anko responded, smiling at her sons, ruffling their hair. Now, I believe, there is the matter of getting used to your new eyes. The Hokage said. Naruto, you'll need help to use your eyes correctly, and there isn't any real point in separating you two, since it would be nice if you both activated the Sharingan. I'll have some specialized training set up for the two of you starting next week. Until then, I suggest you get to know each other better. 
The old man smiled and exited the door, leaving the three-person family alone for the first time since its conception. One week later, the two boys found themselves waiting to meet their new sensei. He was currently running a good hour and a half late, and both boys were beginning to wonder if he'd ever show up. Yo, sorry I'm late, you see there was this kitten, and it was caught in a tree a voice said, approaching the two young ninjas in training. The two looked at the newcomer with identical stares of both disbelief and anger. He was a tall man with grey hair, although he wasn't old, and it stuck up in many different angles, not unlike Naruto's old hair. He was wearing dark pants and a dark shirt under the standard issue vest, as well as black fingerless gloves that had a metal plate on the back of the hand to block swords. The most peculiar aspect of the man was that his Konoha head protector was pulled over his left eye, completely obscuring it, and he wore a mask that effectively covered his face and nose. You two are Sasuke and Naruto, I assume? The silver-haired man asked the bewildered boys. They just nodded their heads looking at their sensei, he seemed well, they didn't know how he seemed, there was something about him, he seemed dangerous, even if he was an hour and a half late. Why don't we introduce ourselves? You can tell us your likes, dislikes, hobbies, dreams for the future, those kinds of things. I'll start off, my name is Hada Kakashi, I don't feel like telling you my likes or dislikes, my dreams for the future. I have a lot of hobbies. He finished, giving absolutely no detail in his cryptic answer. Great, all we learned was his name. The boys thought to themselves. Well, my name is Ichiha Sasuke, I like my family and training, I have a few things that I don't like, my hobbies hmm, I guess I don't really have any, as for my dreams, I want to start my own family and I want to help my family accomplish their goals. The raven-haired boy said. Hmm, he didn't mention Itachi, I guess that's a good thing. Kakashi thought. My name is Midarashi Naruto, I like my family and ramen. I dislike the three minute wait for the ramen to cook, my hobbies are training with my brother and mom and trying all the different types of ramen that I can find. My dream is to become Hokage and help my family with their dreams. He finished. Hmm, ramen obsessed boy, but he's got a hard dream. Kakashi thought. He stared at the boys before him, Sasuke in his usual blue t-shirt and shorts with a red and white Ichiha fan on the back and Naruto, who had taken to wearing black shorts with a bunch of pockets on them, with a white shirt. The interesting thing about the shirt was the clan symbol on the back. It seemed to be a mixture of the orange swirl he had donned under the name of Uzumaki Naruto and the Ichiha fan. It was an orange and red swirl, divided just as the Ichiha fan was. Well, my job for the time being is to help you two learn to harness the power of the Sharingan. Sasuke, since you haven't awoken yours yet, we'll be doing drills and exercises to help you, and Naruto, since you have fully developed Sharingan already, you just need to learn to use the correct amount of chakra to activate them. You'll be doing mostly chakra control exercises. Both of you will do drills with me until you get the hang of the Sharingan. Kakashi explained. After their first day of practice, Kakashi pulled Sasuke aside, since Naruto was being stubborn and still practicing his chakra control. Sasuke, I don't wish to bring up a potentially sore subject, but when I agreed to take on this assignment, I was given a psychological evaluation, and it said that, when you were admitted to the hospital, you were set on killing your brother, but today you didn't mention him. I hope you don't mind me asking, but what happened, was the report wrong? Sasuke glared at his instructor before sighing. No, when I moved in with Naruto and Anko, I was pretty set on killing him. Flashback. Sasuke was unpacking his belongings into his new room, which he shared with Naruto. Anko's apartment wasn't that big and they were looking for a larger place to live, but for now it was her apartment or nothing. Naruto was moving his stuff into the room as well, and Sasuke was shocked to find that everything of value that Naruto had could easily fit into a backpack. Naruto. Sasuke said, breaking the silence of the room. I understand that my brother attacked you, but Itachi is mine to kill. If you get in the way, then I may be forced to kill you. Don't get in my way. The brooding boy warned. Naruto looked at his new brother like he had some kind of marine animal stuck to his face. I don't care, you can kill him if you want. He shrugged. Now it was Sasuke's turn to be perplexed. How can you not want revenge for what he did to you? He asked. Oh, it's not that I don't want revenge, but it comes second. I don't know about you, but revenge isn't going to control what I do, so you don't have to worry about me getting in the way. Naruto explained. You obviously don't get it, I have to kill him. I am an Ichiha, and I must avenge my family. It's all my fault that they died, I couldn't do anything. At this Sasuke began to break down a bit, and tears came to his eyes. Sasuke, it's not your fault. You're in the academy, learning to be a ninja, and he's Anbu. There's nothing that you could have done. If you had been there to help them, you would have died too. Naruto said. Sasuke crossed the room in a second and pinned Naruto against the wall. You don't get it, do you? 
He hissed that I'm an Ichiha, I must avenge my clan. No, I do get it, you think that because you're from this clan, that you must avenge their deaths. You forget that your brother is also an Ichiha. This simply confused Sasuke even more. What the hell are you talking about? He asked the boy, trying to calm himself down. Look, you know how to cross multiply numbers, right? Naruto asked him. Sasuke merely nodded his head, not understanding where this was going. So you know that when you cross multiply like terms will cancel each other out. Think about it. You're an Ichiha in the academy, he's an Ichiha in Anbu. If you could cross multiply the two, then you're stuck with an academy student against an Anbu. You never would have stood a chance. Naruto articulated. This struck Sasuke deep. He hadn't thought of his life in such a scientific way before. It made so much sense. Look, Sasuke, I'm not telling you to abandon your goal, but you shouldn't worry about it until you can match him. I'm sure one day, you'll see him again, and be able to kill him, but that won't be until you're at least a, more than likely, not until you're a. Don't worry about it for now, and focus on other things. Naruto simply left the room to find his mom, and give Sasuke some room to think. Then flashback. Sasuke Ari told the story of Naruto's logic to Kakashi, who was very impressed by the dead last's ability to change Sasuke so easily. It's not a good thing to be an Avenger. Avengers lead a life of pain and suffering. They live for one reason, and if they ever accomplish their goal, they are left with a feeling of emptiness and despair. They become so caught up in their own world that they become social outcasts and loners. It is not a life that I wish upon anyone. With that Kakashi dismissed the boys for the day. The boys walked back to their apartment at a quick pace, hoping to make it back in time to shower before dinner. The looks that they received were surprising to Sasuke, especially the first time he noticed them. He was used to people recognizing him because he was from the Achiha clan, but the looks people gave Anko and Naruto made him shiver every once and a while. At first it was simply at Anko, she brushed it off, scowling at the people foolish enough to make a remark behind her back. He wasn't able to hear what they were talking about, except for the word snake. After a while, the looks began to move towards Naruto. Even after the changes he went through, people recognized who he was. Sasuke was taken by surprise by the sneers and glares he received. It surprised him just as much when Naruto brushed them away by smiling at them. Flashback. It was the day after Sasuke's minor blow up at Naruto and the boys were sitting around their new apartment, waiting for Anko to return from shopping. Hey, Naruto, why didn't you go with your mom? Sasuke asked. He himself hadn't gone because he was still digesting the conversation he had had yesterday. Well, I didn't want mom to have any more problems. He said, rather cryptically. What do you mean? How could you cause problems for her? The full-blooded Ichiha asked his brother. Naruto looked at his feet, swinging them in front of his body. You saw the way people look at me, right? He asked. Keeping his eyes rooted on the floor. Yeah. They look at me like that because I have the Kaiubi sealed inside of me. He said, quietly. Suddenly, his voice took a much more serious tone. Look, I don't care if you hate me, but if you use that to hurt Kasan, then I'll kill you. Sasuke was shocked. The reason that Naruto had grown up without any kind of care was that he had a demon sealed inside of him. That didn't make any sense. But that would explain the looks the younger boy received, as well as Anko. As the mother of the Kaiubi vessel, she was probably seen as an anathema. Not to mention the hisses he heard yesterday, first calling his adopted mother a snake and then openly hating his adopted brother. Naruto I don't hate you. It's just a lot to take in. Sasuke stammered. The rest of the day was spent in silence, waiting for Anko to return with dinner. She seemed to notice the look on her son's face, as well as the look of heavy contemplation that graced Sasuke's face. When she asked what was wrong, Naruto denied that anything was amiss, and Sasuke simply shook his head. That night, when the boys were lying in their room, sleep had decided to fail them. Hey, Naruto Sasuke started to speak, but paused for a second. I don't hate you, for the Kaiubi. I think you're actually pretty brave to put up with all the stuff you do. Naruto turned over to the boy and, although Sasuke couldn't see him, stared at the boy. Then Naruto returned to his previous position and tried to go back to sleep. Before he managed to find refuge though, he said. Thanks, Sasuke. You're the first person I've told besides the Hokage and Kasan, so this means a lot to me. The boys remained silent for the remainder of the night before finally falling asleep. Then flashback. After that day, the three people living under the roof of Anko's apartment could actually feel like a family. Sasuke and Naruto acting as each other's brother and Anko as a mother to Naruto and a surrogate mother to Sasuke. That night Sasuke had made a decision that he would protect his new family. He didn't know that Naruto had done the same thing. The next few months passed quickly for the two boys, between the academy and their training with Kakashi, they had little time for other activities. 
they would attend the academy until 3 in the afternoon and then train with Kakashi until 5 or 6 and then return for dinner. Anko proved to be a very capable mother, caring for her two sons and keeping up with her duties. She would often be seen sparring with Naruto and Sasuke or simply chasing them if they were running late for any reason. As remarkable as Anko's transformation was, the most noticeable changes were in Naruto and Sasuke. Sasuke had, for the moment, given up on avenging his family and embraced his foster mother and brother. Without feeling the need to measure up to his murderous brother, he became almost social. He still abhorred the attention he received from his fangirls, but he would make attempts to meet the other people in his class. It had taken him a while, but almost five weeks of constant training and different combat scenarios with Kakashi and Naruto had awoken his Sharingan. It wasn't complete, but he wasn't expecting it to be, and was actually quite happy when he noticed that his right eye had two of the strange coma-like marks in them instead of one. Naruto had changed the most. With the love of his mother and the attention of his brother, he quickly gave up his prankster ways and devoted himself to both his schoolwork and training. It had taken him almost as long as Sasuke to reawaken the Sharingan, but he finally did, if only one day before his brother. He was leading a happy life now, and a large part of that was due, in part, to Sasuke. Before the majority of the village had harbored grudges or hatred against the boy, but now about half of the village was reconsidering their previous opinions. One half of the village was convinced that Naruto had conned the remaining Achiha into being his brother, while the other half were convinced that Sasuke could do no wrong and thus accepted Naruto as part of society. After the training with Kakashi ended, the boys continued to train together and further their skills. Sasuke remained entrenched at the top of the class, but Naruto was quickly climbing the ladder and was closing in on the middle of the class. Naruto was constantly trying to find out if he had absorbed any more bloodline limits, so far unsuccessfully, and learning how to integrate the Sharingan and some of his new techniques into his fighting style. Naruto had never learned any type of rigid tojutsu style, and he liked that. It gave him an unpredictability that he found helpful. Sasuke had continued to train in the basic academy tojutsu, but he threw in some moves he learned from Anko and Naruto to give his arsenal more variety. He had also picked up Anko's love of kunai and other throwing weapons. He didn't have the experience that his adoptive mother did in close-range combat, his throwing accuracy wasn't bad, and he consistently hit his mark with little or no effort. It was during one of Sasuke's throwing exercises that Naruto finally discovered another bloodline. Once again, Sasuke was trying to throw 10 kunai and have them deflect off each other to hit 10 separate targets. He had gotten to the point where he could hit 8 or 9, but the 10th continuously eluded him. Jumping into the air, he took a breath to calm himself down and focus on his task before he released the throwing knives. Sweeping his arms out, Sasuke released the metallic objects from between his fingers and began to ride himself for his descent towards the ground. Clink. 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 The knives bounced off of each other, and Sasuke ventured a look at their trajectory. With nine simultaneous thuds, nine of the kunai embedded themselves into the intended targets. Am, still only nine. Now where is that other one? He thought. He heard the yelp of his brother and figured that his kunai might have gone off course more than he had thought. What he saw confused the Ichiha to no end. Naruto was sitting in the shade of a large tree, and there, not a foot in front of the younger boy's face, was the kunai. Floating in midair. Old man. Naruto yelled as he burst into the office of the Hokage. Something happened, and we don't know what it was, but it was cool. We figured you would know so we came here. Upon hearing the we in the statement Sasuke walked into the room. Why don't you tell me what happened, and I'll see if I can help you boys. The venerable Hokage said, smiling at the close kinship the two shared. I was taking a break from climbing trees when one of Sasuke's kunai came flying at me. I panicked because I didn't have time to block it, so I put my arm out like this. He raised his right hand in a warding motion, while he used his left arm to cover his head, and when I didn't get hit, I looked, and it was just floating in the air. This confused the Hokage. He had never heard of something like this. Is it a kind of chakra shield? He asked. No, we figured out that it could only repel metal objects. I tried throwing different things at Naruto, and the pebbles, dirt clods, and my sandal all got through, but he can stop kunai and shuriken in midair. Sasuke explained. That's why we came here, either it has something to do with metal, magnets, or this field only stops deadly things. The Hokage thought about this for a minute. Hmm, I have an idea how we can find out. He took out one of his many paperweights and laid it in front of Naruto. Try to change the shape of this, if you can, Naruto. He said. Naruto concentrated on the paperweight, which was shaped like a leaf, and willed it to become a simple block. Nothing happened. He tried for five minutes, concentrating on the leaf and willing it to change, but it never did. 
Well, I think we can say that your ability isn't to control metal. Sandame explained. I also think that your own tests show that it isn't some kind of force field, so I believe, Naruto, that you have a very rare bloodline that was originally from Sunagakur. Their Sandame had the ability to control magnetic forces and used it to control small pieces of metal for him. Naruto and Sasuke stood there with their mouths agape and stared wide-eyed at the gray-haired man. That is so cool. Naruto yelled in triumph. I have a Kazakiyaj bloodline. Yes, I suggest that you practice both repelling and attracting different things, it could come in handy someday. Sandame suggested. In the meantime, I believe that your mother should be arriving shortly to turn in her report, so why don't you two just wait here for a while? True to his word, Anko walked into the office not three minutes later to deliver her report. It was a straightforward mission, guarding the fire country's daimyo from a missing min. It wasn't very hard, and she finished early. When Naruto explained about his new bloodline, Anko smirked and ruffled his hair. All right, from now on I expect to have to try during our kunai duels. This earned a groan from Naruto, who hadn't inherited his mother's love of kunai, much to her disappointment. Naruto's birthday, October 10th, rolled around rather quickly. He still hadn't perfected using his magnetic abilities, but he was getting better. Dawn came early, and the boys were awoken by Anko's usual greeting, a bucket full of cold water. After a quick warm-up, read. Five hours of being chased by your mother, who is throwing kunai at you, the trio headed home for brunch. As the day wore on, both Sasuke and Anko noticed that Naruto was more and more reluctant to leave the apartment. They figured it had to do with the Kaiubi, and when they asked him, he explained that the villagers always hated him more today and had grown accustomed to staying inside to minimize contact with drunk and or irate villagers. Anko decided to stay and comfort her son more that night, and so Sasuke was the only one to go out to enjoy the festival, although it was rather subdued now that he knew of Naruto's burden. He watched as the smaller children ran around, enjoying the games and food of the festival. In reality, Sasuke was appalled by the villagers' treatment of Naruto. He had only come out to honor the Achiha who had died in the attack, and then he planned on returning back to the apartment. After a nice speech by the Hokage, Sasuke walked back towards the apartment, passing different restaurants along the way. He heard different people talking in various states of inebriation about different worries, from raising their kids to the state of the village. Once he returned home he joined his adoptive mother and brother for dessert before he headed to bed. As he was taking his dishes over to the sink, he looked out the window at the sky, noting the new moon. But what interested him the most was the group of flickering orange lights that were making their way towards the apartment building. He didn't immediately recognize the glow of torches, simply passing them off as part of the festivities, but he did seem to recognize the silver-haired leading a group of 20 or 30 people. What is Mizuki-sensei doing? He thought. It wasn't until he heard the shouts of kill the demon. Then it hit him. Shit. Anko Kasan, there's a mob outside. Sasuke yelled in warning. What? The purple-haired yelled as the door to the apartment was kicked in. The first person in the doorway was greeted by a kunai to the shoulder, courtesy of an enraged mother. The second person met a similar fate, this time from Sasuke. Mizuki forced his way towards the door, losing shuriken as he entered and multiplying them with cage shuriken no jutsu, shadow shuriken technique, he was absolutely dumbfounded when the multitude of metal seemed to slow and hover in midair. You will not hurt Kasan. Naruto screamed and repelled the shuriken back towards the mass of now shocked villagers. Mizuki was able to use a kawarimi no replacement technique to avoid the multitude of steel throwing stars. Shuriken are not as lethal as kunai unless they embed themselves in the throater head, so damage to the mob was minimal. However, the only person standing was Mizuki who took the moment of shock to organize another attack on the demon. He knew he couldn't hope to beat Anko, so he decided to try and burn out the three ninja. Pain. Kakaku no jutsu. Fire type. Grand fireball technique. Mizuki then unleashed a very large ball of fire towards the apartment, only for his fireball to be doused by two cries of suit and sujinheki. Water type. Water barrier from Naruto and Sasuke. How do you know that? Mizuki stammered as he froze upon seeing the boys perform, then he noticed that both boys had red eyes with comma mark circling the iris. Shuringen. That's not possible. He watched as Naruto raised his right arm and leveled it at him, while Sasuke simply smirked at his brother's antics. Suddenly Mizuki felt his arms begin to fall asleep. Then his legs, and the last thing he remembered before he passed out, was wondering what the hell was going on. Very quickly, Anbu swarmed Anko's apartment, and before too long the Hokage appeared a look of grim anger on his face as he watched the Anbu round up the members of the incapacitated mob. He walked over to Anko who was checking on her sons, making sure they were okay. Would you three be able to tell me what happened? The old man asked. Okage-sama, Sasuke began, stifling a yawn due to exhaustion. 
These people were trying to, yawn, kill Naruto. His eyes drooped into sleep as he was talking. The Hokage noticed that Naruto was also drifting off to sleep, so he suggested that Anko move them to bed and that she give the report after that was done. After moving the two into their beds, a very angry Anko moved back towards the living room and addressed the Hokage. Okage-sama, those people broke down the door and were calling for my son's head, so Sasuke and I defended our home. Then Cage Shuriken no Jutsu and Naruto stopped them with his new bloodline before throwing them back at the crowd. That put most of them out of commission, but Mizuki managed to get out of the way and tried to burn down the apartment. Naruto and Sasuke were able to stop him using Sujinheki, and then I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I think Naruto used his magnetic bloodline again to do something to Mizuki and made him pass out. Anko spat, incensed that people would be prejudiced against her son in such a manner. The fact that the two boys were able to use a water barrier was astounding to the Hokage. Anko, where did they get the water from? He asked, perplexed. I guess from the sink, Sasuke left it on because they broke through the door. She replied, picking up some things that had been scattered by the intrusion. To be able to keep a technique like that up at their age, I believe that we can expect them to grow up to be very strong. The Hokage remarked. The day following the mob attack on Naruto dawned with grey skies, threatening to pour rain and an unusual humidity for the fall weather. Both boys were sleeping soundly when Anko decided to wake them up around 8 in the morning. After their display last night they deserved to rest up. Quickly shaking Naruto and Sasuke awake, she hurried them out of bed and told them that breakfast was ready and that they had matters to discuss. The boys entered the small kitchen dining room after a few minutes and rubbing the sleep from their eyes muttered a thanks as they accepted their breakfast of cereal and toast. First off, Anko started, her face holding no emotion. I want to congratulate the two of you on your performance last night. The way you boys were able to use the water barrier at your age shows great potential and chakra control. Secondly, I want to know what you did to Mizuki. She spat out the silver-haired man's name like she was cursing. The boys exchanged sheepish glances, which were quickly covered by mischievous grins. Well, ever since I discovered the magnetic bloodline, I was looking for a way to attack people directly with it. I've been trying to pull the iron from the ground and tried to do the same thing to humans. But since I can't go and try it on people, I haven't gotten very far. Last night I think I used the fox's power and that was how I was able to beat Mizuki Sina Mizuki. Naruto explained. If nothing else, Naruto had adopted his mother's ideals about hating people. If they crossed him wrong like last night, they were forever an anathema, and he would treat them as such. I just wish he would have used something cool, so I could have copied them. Sasuke complained. This elicited a laugh from everyone, and the mood switched to lighter conversation, before the boys had to leave for school. Life settled down, and fell into routine for the three. Two years passed without incident, and the boys were starting their, hopefully, final year in the academy. The two had grown up and closer together than anyone could have hoped for. Sasuke had grown close to 5 feet 3 inches and showed no signs of slowing down, while Naruto was smaller, at 4 feet 11 inches, but was a bit quicker than his brother, who was physically stronger. That day at the academy, the class was reviewing the different techniques that they might have to demonstrate at their graduation exam. The selected skill today was the Henge Knower transformation. As Aruka sensei called each member of the class up to change into a copy of him, he couldn't be more proud of his students. They were easily one of the best overall groups he had ever taught. Aruno Sakura. The brown-haired called out. The pink-haired Sasuke fangirl quickly moved to the front of the class and formed the correct hand seals before calling out Henge. A puff of smoke appeared and after it disappeared, a perfect copy of Aruka smiled back at the teacher. Very good, Sakura. He admonished the girl. Next up is Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto made his way down the rows of desks and stood in the front of the class. It had been decided after much arguing and yelling that Naruto should keep the name Uzumaki, since Orochimaru would come back for the boy if he found out he was alive. The only people who knew him as Midarashi Naruto were Sasuke, Anko, Iruka, Kakashi, and the Hokage. Iruka had originally been skeptical of allowing the Kaiubi container into the academy, however, after seeing how hard the boy worked and how he interacted with the other students, he grew to like the energetic boy. Naruto adopted the classic Sasuke pose and slouched a bit before performing the technique perfectly. The job Naruto. Next up is Ichiha Sasuke. Sasuke sauntered to the front in his typical lazy I don't care type of manner before lazily forming the seals. No one noticed the unusual twinkle in the raven-haired boy's eyes before it was too late. Henge. The boy said in a very lazy manner. It was so lazy that it made Shikamaru seem energetic and playful. As the smoke cleared, the sight of a naked woman with black hair greeted Aruka. As his nose erupted in a fountain of blood, he could only think one sentence. The hell. 
I figured Naruto or Kiba would try something like that, but Sasuke. The class erupted in laughter from the male population and indignation from the females of the class. They couldn't bring themselves to believe that their beloved Sasuke-kun would do something so perverted. In another cloud of smoke Sasuke returned to normal and broodingly walked back to his seat. Or rather, he walked back to Naruto's seat. As Ruka got back up from the floor with wads of tissue stuck up his nose to prevent further blood loss, he noticed the two Sasuke's and groaned. He had been pranked. He watched as the second Sasuke disappeared in a cloud of smoke and was replaced by Naruto, who promptly doubled over in laughter at his teacher's expense. Ami, Hiruka sensei you should have seen the look on your face when I did that. The blonde and black-haired youth cried out in laughter, rolling in the aisle. That night was interesting, to say the least. Anko was torn between outrage and maternal pride at her son's antics. She was very proud of the fact that he could keep up two illusions, which admittedly were his worst skill, and that he had pulled such an elaborate and hilarious ruse. On the other hand he had done something perverted, and like all women, Anko despised perverts. She settled on increasing the ferocity in her training. Neither Sasuke or Naruto showed up to class without sporting new cuts from their mother's kunai. Okay, today we're going to be reviewing the Bunshin no clone technique, Iruka explained. Naruto groaned, Bunshin was his worst skill. It wasn't that he didn't know how, he had copied the seals with his Sharingan and practiced the technique for hours, but he simply couldn't do it correctly, and for the life of him, he couldn't figure out why. Sasuke didn't know what was wrong, and his mother wasn't much help. She figured that it had to do with his abnormally large amount of chakra and, in comparison, his poor chakra control. Truthfully Naruto had been practicing his control since he started training with Kakashi, but with all his extra chakra, he always seemed to be behind the others. Suddenly inspiration struck him like a well. He'd asked the old man. He'll know what to do. After class, Naruto told Sasuke to go home without him and that he had something to talk with the Hokage about. Sasuke was about to follow his brother anyway, but was sidetracked when a group of fangirls began to chase after him. Naruto headed towards the Hokage's office and asked to see the old man. The secretary told him to wait because the Hokage was in a meeting and couldn't be disturbed. As the meeting ended, representatives from the surrounding villages exited the office, and Naruto walked past them all into the Sandame's office. Hey, I've got a problem. Naruto said when he saw that he had the Hokage's attention. I can't do Bunshin, and I can't figure out why. Mom thinks it's cause I've got such high amounts of chakra, but she's not sure. Can you perform the technique for me? Asked a gray-haired leader. Naruto performed a technique and was rewarded with three dead and deformed clones. Um. Yes, I would agree with your mother, you do have too much chakra. Sandame said. Now, Naruto, there are other forms of Bunshin that are actually more useful. There's the Mizu Bunshin that creates a solid clone out of water, and the Tsuchi Bunshin is made of earth. These require more chakra than normal, so you should be able to do those without problem. The only problem is that we don't have any way to teach you those particular techniques. If you ever encounter them, do me a favor and copy them, that way we can write them down. The old man chuckled at the joke. The only other variation we have of the Bunshin is the Cage Bunshin, Shadow Clone, which takes up a large amount of chakra, but it creates solid clones. Unfortunately, since it uses such a large amount of chakra, it would be a bad idea to try and copy it, so you will have to learn it the old-fashioned way. Now it is a Kenjutsu, so I can't just give you a copy of it, but if you'll stop by my office, oh say, this weekend, I will teach you how to perform it. Naruto sat in a chair and stared at the old man. He was going to learn Kenjutsu. Plus, he would be able to pass the graduation exam this way. Okay, I'll stop by over the weekend to learn this see you later old man. Naruto exclaimed as he exited the office. That weekend Naruto returned to the office of the Hokage to learn the forbidden technique Cage Bunshin. It turned out to be easier than he expected, but the old man didn't lie when he said it used a lot of chakra. The principle behind the skill was simple enough. Take a normal Bunshin and put about 10 times more chakra than necessary to create one clone, and then another 3 or 4 times as much chakra to sustain it for any reasonable length of time. In the end it was very easy to see why it was forbidden. He had agreed to show Sasuke, but both boys realized that the full-blooded Ichiha didn't have the chakra reserves necessary to perform the technique. However, the two did find another form of solid Bunshin they could both use. They were watching some of the different shinobi of the village train and found Kakashi was dueling with a green spandex-clad man with thick eyebrows and a bowl cut, except that Kakashi was a Mizu Bunshin. The two boys then conned the lazy into showing them the technique which they learned and used in their training routines. Time moved quickly after that weekend. The two boys continued to train, although they also found time to do other activities. 
both Naruto and Sasuke had become friends quickly with Shikamaru and Chaoji, although it was mostly Naruto who hung out with the lazy boy and the potato chip addicted preteen. Sasuke had struck up a rivalry with Hyuganiji, the previous year's number one rookie, and seemed to be competing against each other in just about everything. After nearly three straight years of being rejected by Sasuke, many of his fangirls decided on another tactic, they tried to become friends with Naruto, Shikamaru, and Chaoji. Naruto hasn't been able to walk through town without being hounded for the last four months, while the other two boys have only recently become targets. Luckily for them, or terribly unlucky for Naruto, Shikamaru's laziness and Chaoji's constant eating seemed to be turn-offs in their own right, while Naruto couldn't claim any of the previous self-defense mechanisms and was sorely tempted to try his mother's tactics and begin to throw kunai indiscriminately. The graduation exams rolled around and, as expected Sasuke was slated to become rookie of the year, while the position of top Kanoichi was in a heated argument between Yamanaka Ino and Haruno Sakura, both of whom were gigantic Sasuke fangirls. Naruto was moving between the top half and top quarter of the class, largely due to his poor effort on written assignments, as he often responded when asked about his poor grades. Who cares what the middle name of the Nidame's brother's third youngest sister was? And who cares if Tsunade of the legendary Sanin is the granddaughter of the Shadame, I mean honestly, when will that ever save my life? Of course, what people fail to notice while he is ranting on like this is the fact that he knew that Tsunade was a part of the legendary Sanin and b was the granddaughter of the first Hokage. It was during one of these rants that he actually got to know Shikamaru after the lazy genius noticed that Naruto knew those facts. While Naruto may have given up physical pranking for the most part, he still loved to mess with people's heads. As Naruto entered the exam room he felt confident that he would pass. Before he would have been worried sick over his inability to perform a bunshin, but now he was able to do two different kinds of bunshin, he felt very sure in himself. Okay Naruto, you have to perform a bunshin to pass. Hiroka said. Deciding to play it relatively safe, Naruto created three Mizu Bunshin from the glass of water on Haruka's desk. Congratulations, you passed. Haruka said after he found his voice again and handed him a Kanoha forehead protector. After that there was time for celebration. The next day, Naruto and Sasuke showed up for their Gen and team assignments. I'd like to congratulate all of you for passing the exam. You are all true shinobi of Kanahagakur and should always wear the symbol of the leaf with pride. Hiruka explained as he began assigning teams. It wasn't until he reached Team 7 that Naruto paid any attention. Team 7, Ichiha Sasuke, Uzumaki Naruto, at this, the two brothers exchanged high fives and head nods in silent approval. And Haruno Sakura. Hiruka finished. Team 8 will be, but before Hiruka could continue, he was cut off by Sakura's voice. Hiruka sensei, why am I on a team with Naruto? Won't that make the teams unbalanced? She asked in a way that made it sound less insulting than it really was. Normally you'd be right, Sakura, but Sasuke was the number one rookie, Naruto ended up around the middle of the class, and although you are the second ranked Kinoichi, all of the teachers thought you could learn the most from being with Sasuke and Naruto. Hiruka explained. Now, team 8 will be Aburam Shino, Hayuga Hinata, and Inuzuka Kiba. Team 9, and with that Naruto quit paying attention again. However he was rudely interrupted from his lazing when team 10 was announced. Team 10, Nara Shikamaru, Akamichi Chaoji, and Yamanaka Ino. This got a groan of displeasure from Shikamaru and Ino. Your sensei will be here shortly to collect your teams. Haruka explained before leaving the room as various people came into the room and picked up teams. Eventually the only team left was Team 7. Sakura was trying to talk with Sasuke who had created a Mizubunshin and then used a basic camouflage to hide while he sat with Naruto, who was somewhere in between sleeping and daydreaming. Do, and a half hours later, a very late Kakashi entered the room, only to be hit on the head with an eraser. He was then forced to dodge two kunai, thrown by Sasuke and Naruto, while Sakura simply tried to stammer an apology for her rude and childish teammate, completely ignoring the fact that Sasuke had also thrown a kunai at the. And if anything was aiming to do more damage than Naruto, since he was aiming for Kakashi's family jewels. Well, my first impression of you guys is I really don't like you. The pepper-haired replied. Meet me on the roof. With that he disappeared in a cloud of smoke. When the three genin arrived at the roof, they found Kakashi sitting on a ledge, reading one of his perverted books. He noticed that Naruto and Sasuke arrived first, followed by a very wet and very angry Sakura. What happened? They asked. She tried to hug Mizubunshin. Came Naruto's reply, his face creeping into a large grin, which was mirrored by Sasuke. Anyway, why don't you all introduce yourselves, you know, likes, dislikes, hobbies, dreams for the future, those kinds of things. Kakashi ordered. Why don't you go first? Asked a drenched Sakura. 
My name is Hattie Kakashi. I don't feel like telling you my likes. My dislikes are personal. As for dreams for the future, I suppose I have a couple of hobbies. Okay, you're up, Pinky. My name is Haruno Sakura. My favorite is she glanced at Sasuke. My dream for the future glanced at Sasuke again. My hobby started with Sasuke. I hate Naruto and Ino Pig. Oh great, a love struck fangirl. How come all the Kanoichi these days only care about boys? Why couldn't I have gotten one like that girl guy has? She's very talented and useful. Kakashi sweat dropped, for the first time in his life, he actually envied Mido guy. The world was ending, he was sure of it. Okay, one of you two, I don't really care which one. He said and motioned towards Naruto and Sasuke. My name is Ichiha Sasuke, I like my family, I dislike, no I hate, my fangirls, I don't have any hobbies, my dream is to start my own family and to help Kasen. Of course this is what Sakura heard. I like my family and Sakura. I want to marry Sakura and love her for all of eternity. This caused her to try and hug the Ichiha again, only to find herself hugging Kakashi, who Sasuke had used as a replacement. This, it was safe to say, caused Naruto to fall to the ground, laughing harder than ever, clutching his sides. My name is Uzumaki Naruto, I like ramen and my family, I dislike anyone who would hurt my family. My hobbies are trying out new ramen flavors and training, and I want to become Hokage and haha ha help my family achieve their dreams. He stated, his words turning into fits of laughter every once in a while. Well, that's it for introductions, meet me tomorrow at 7 o'clock at training ground 32 for survival training. Kakashi exclaimed as he went to leave. But then he noticed that both boys had their Sharingan active, hoping to copy the technique he used to teleport away earlier. He decided to simply take the stairs. As he walked away he heard the angered cries from the two. Damn you, we will figure out how you do that cool technique. Sakura was very very angry. It was 9 o'clock in the morning and neither her teammates nor sensei were at the training grounds. Sure Kakashi had shown up late yesterday, but surely he wouldn't do the same thing twice, right? Wrong. Not only was he late, he was even later than yesterday. Not to mention the fact that Naruto and Sasuke weren't there yet either. Just as she was about to storm out of the area and find her tardy teammates, the two boys in question appeared on the edge of the area, chatting and walking at a relaxed pace. Seeing the two walk in so casually made Sakura's already boiling blood bubble over. What the hell are you two doing? She screamed at the boys when they came in range of her voice. You're two hours late. Oh, Sasuke-kun, did that Baka slow you down, I know you wouldn't be late if he didn't. She gushed at a crush. The pair was saved from answering her by the arrival of their grey-haired sensei. Yo. Kakashi greeted the team with his standard introduction. You're late. Sakura bellowed at the. Well, you see, there was this dog attacking a mime, and he couldn't call for help, so I had to spend the next hour trying to decipher his gestures. He wasn't very good. Then when I took him to the hospital, he still refused to talk, even to give his name and other information, so that took a while. Kakashi explained. You're lying. Sakura complained bitterly. Anyway, your test is to get these from me before this timer goes off. Kakashi explained, showing the three two silver bells. If you don't, I'll send you back to the academy. He drawled lazily. But sensei, there are only two bells. Sakura dumbly stated. Yes, well, this exam does have a high rate of failure. Their sensei explained. Well, the timer is set for noon, so you've got about three hours to get a bell. Begin. With that, the three genin hopefuls disappeared into the surrounding forest. Well, Naruto and Sasuke are well hidden, they might actually be able to pass this time if they can get Sakura to work with them. Kakashi thought while taking note of the surroundings. All three genin were hidden well, although he could still see them, but then again, he wasn't for nothing. Meanwhile, Sakura was watching Kakashi impatiently. She was sure that Naruto would jump the gun and attack their sensei first, but it seemed like he had more sense than she gave him credit for. I must try and find Sasuke-kun, and then we can come up with a plan to get those bells. She thought as she searched the area for her crush, however she couldn't find him or Naruto. She quietly moved around the shrubs and bushes trying to find the Ichiha air, but she failed. As time began to tick away, she became more and more worried. If she didn't get a bell soon, she would never be on the same team as her beloved Sasuke-kun. As she was searching, Kakashi found himself occupied with a two-sided attack from the boys. Naruto attacked from the left and Sasuke the right. The boys targeted his feet, which he easily dodged by jumping in the air, only to meet a pair of kunai thrown from the boys on his way up. He was taken by their thoroughness, the kunai didn't leave him room to dodge them, and so he quickly blocked them. Before he could be too proud of himself, he was knocked back towards earth by the boys, this time from above. One set must be clones of some sort. Kakashi concluded. But damn, that stung. 
he was met once again by two fists, courtesy of Naruto and Sasuke, his own weight increasing the force of the blow. However, his body was quickly replaced by a section of log. Shit, Kawarimi. Replacement technique, the boys thought, before scattering back into the woods to hide. Meanwhile, Kakashi was nursing an aching back and thanking his lucky stars that the boys were slower coming up than going down. If the attack had been coordinated and struck at the same time, they might have very well gotten the bells. Sakura saw the display of Tajutsu from the tag team with mouth agape and eyes wide. Who knew that Naruto and Sasuke could fight so well together? This time she was able to keep her eyes trained on the boys and she quickly made her way towards the two before she was interrupted. Yo. Kakashi's voice traveled to her ears from behind and slightly above her and she quickly whirled around, kunai in her hand in a defensive stance. But when her eyes caught up to her body, she didn't find her teacher. In fact, she didn't find anything. What she did find was a big black emptiness that engulfed her. Suddenly out of the darkness a weak voice emerged, calling for her assistance. Asakura. Why you need to Kakashi Hichi Sasuke's broken voice was quickly followed up by his equally broken body, kunai puncturing his arms like a pin cushion, and he was showing signs of obvious blood loss. Upon seeing her crush's deformed features, Sakura proceeded to promptly faint at the she had been ensnared in. Kakashi was watching the Kinoichi, and sweat dropped at her inability to recognize the obvious mental attack. Okay, maybe Meijin. Narakumi no Jutsu, Demonic Illusion. Hell viewing technique was a little much. Kakashi thought, nah, it isn't a high level or anything, she should have been able to detect it, the report said she'd make a great specialist, like Kurinai, now there's a thought, how come she wasn't put with her? Kakashi was unable to think for too long, he still had two to humiliate her test, however he felt like seeing it. Much to his dismay, however, the two siblings were very difficult to find, causing them to consider using his dogs once or twice. But such tricks shouldn't be wasted on, and he decided to follow the sparse clues they left about for him. Twice he thought he had cornered the duo, only to find them to be shadow clones using Henge or Bunshin. These two would be very interesting to teach. The gray-haired man mused. Eventually, he was able to find them, his excellent tracking abilities and above-average speed helped him locate the boys. They were in a clearing, taking stock of their kunai and other gear. They had shown great skill at trap setting and recognition. They had picked through the double-layered traps he had laid with ease, and it was unlikely that they would encounter more than two layers of traps. Before he could even greet them, he was forced to dodge a set of kunai courtesy of Naruto and a swift ijutsu attack from Sasuke. Kakashi was able to block the right jab from the Achiha and the ensuing left roundhouse kick. He even managed to grab the boy's left hand as it flew towards his face, but it was during this period of fighting that Naruto snuck up from behind to grab the bells. With both of his hands occupied grappling with Sasuke, Kakashi couldn't use any techniques to stop the younger boy. But he was an elite ninja after all, and he had the perfect solution to this problem. He tripped the attacking boy. Yep, mister. I'll be the next Hokage was tripped and thus missed his chance to grab the silver bells that were so critical to their success. Quickly, Kakashi threw Sasuke into his brother, giving him the space to perform a quick counter-attack. As the boys picked themselves up from the ground they noticed the glaring absence of their sensei. However, they remembered a pearl of wisdom their mother had implanted with them. If you can't see your enemy, go to a place where you have a good defensive and observational position. The two scattered into the tree branches, just as Kakashi exploded from the ground. The two quickly flashed through the hand seals for Katen. Hausenka no Jutsu, fire type. Mythical Phoenix Flower, and peppered the surrounding area with the miniature fireballs. Kakashi was forced to dodge them, and in doing so, moved him back towards a thick grove of trees. These two will be interesting. Now if they could just figure out the true purpose of this test. The muse to himself, dodging the joint attack from the boys once more. Sasuke quickly flashed through the seals for Hausenka no Jutsu once more, forcing the to dodge to his right and confront Naruto who flashed through the seals for Katen. Kakaku no Jutsu, fire type. Grand fireball, and inhaled deeply before launching a large ball of flame from his mouth. As the fire settled down, the duo was able to make out the form of a tree section, once more the victim of a Kawarimi no, courtesy of the masked. Said Jounin was currently cursing the two for actually making him work so hard to put them down. Their tandem style of attacking was very good, and both boys were better fighters than either of their profiles had indicated. Sasuke had much more chakra than his profile stated, and a greater level of control, as well. Naruto was simply faster and stronger than indicated. Together the two made an excellent team, and in the coming years would prove to be invaluable to the Leaf. As he was mulling this over in his mind, he heard the ring of the timer, indicating that the three had run out of time. Well, I guess that it's Sakura I'll be tying to the tree this time. Kakashi stated more to himself than to the boys who were stewing over their inability to retrieve the bells. 
Sakura opened her eyes and found herself staring at her sensei. Well actually she was staring at his legs, and when she tried to stand up, she found herself tied to a large wooden stump. To her right were the boys who still seemed angry that they hadn't retrieved the bells. Well, that was informative. The voice of her tardy sensei drifted towards her ears. Sakura, your profile stated that you were excellent at recognizing, but you fell for a fairly simple one. If you can't focus under pressure, then you will not survive your first battle between ninja. Sasuke and Naruto, your planning was excellent, your execution was nearly flawless, and you both showed great potential, but you lost track of time, which is one of the more important things a shinobi must keep track of, especially in the field. Although you all failed, Naruto and Sasuke showed that the records of this village are a bit outdated, so I will give you another chance. But it will be much harder than before. He tossed two bentos towards the boys. You two can eat, but don't give any to Sakura. Be ready to come at me with the intent to kill me after lunch. But that he poofed away in a cloud of white smoke, leaving the threesome alone. The boys began to eat their lunches, but stopped about halfway through. Sakura was inwardly fuming over the fact that it was her own uselessness that nearly cost them their opportunity to become genin. Her stomach was growling, already having digested her light breakfast, and wishing that she could eat the food the boys had left over. It came as a great surprise to her when the two boys offered their remaining food to the pink-haired girl. Here, eat up. Sasuke directed. A Kakashi sensei told you guys not to give me any food. She dumbly stated. Yeah, but he isn't here right now, and besides, we're pretty sure the idea of the test is to exhibit teamwork. I mean, why else would teams be made of three people? He can't send one of us back to the academy, it's either all or nothing. Naruto explained, filling her in on the conversation he and Sasuke had earlier, as Sasuke cut through the ropes tying her to the stump. Sakura quickly rubbed the feeling back into her wrists and was about to take the first bite of food when Kakashi reappeared in another cloud of smoke. Do you pass? His voice changed from unbridled fury to a complimentary tone in mere seconds. He was greeted by two smirks and a look of surprise from his students. Naruto and Sasuke were right, you are in a three-man team for a reason. I can't fail just one or two of you, it's all or nothing. Sasuke and Naruto showed that they could work together very well, but to be a team, the three of you must be willing to cooperate and work as a team. Do you see that monument over there? That is the monument for fallen heroes. They have all died in the name of this village. Some of them should be here right now, walking around, but they aren't because they either couldn't or didn't work as a team. Remember, the three of you are a team, but you are more than just three names on a piece of paper in some filing cabinet. To become a complete team, you must trust each other to do what you alone cannot. From this point forth, you are team 7, but you must become comrades and friends if you truly wish to become a team. Remember, in this world of shinobi, those who break the rules are considered trash. None of the other teams I have instructed shared their food with the other members, they were foolish enough to listen to my instructions, but those who would abandon their friends are worse than trash. The three sat, listening to Kakashi's explanation, they were all thinking the same thing. It seems like he knows this from personal experience. Come to think of it, he probably does. Well, anyway, meet me at the Hokage Tower tomorrow for your first mission. With that, Kakashi poofed away in a cloud of smoke to the chorus of curses coming from the two boys. At night there was a celebration in the Midarashi household. Anko took the boys out to dinner for their accomplishments. She told the boys that no one had ever passed Kakashi's test before, so she was really proud of them. She bought each of her sons a new set of kunai, as well as an imitation of her own trademark trench coat. Sasuke's was a dark dark blue that almost seemed black and had the Achiha crest on the back. It had many hidden pockets for carrying weapons, as well as other supplies. Naruto's was a dark grey, and the only markings on it was the hybrid Achiha fan and Uzumaki swirl design he had created. It was proudly worn on the collar of his coat. It was a great surprise when the Sandame also gave them some gifts. Sasuke received a very old manual from the Hokage, supposedly from his ancestors. It was all about how to manipulate fire for different techniques and is thought to have led to the creation of many of the newer fires, Naruto received different books and scrolls that taught the basics of sealing. Sandame explained that while the Yandame didn't have a bloodline limit in the traditional sense, he did create many different seals that could only be used by people of his blood. Saratobi had learned, in his many dealings with Naruto, that if any information was written down, the boy would pick it up very quickly. It was when information was simply shown to him or during oral examinations that the boys struggled. In truth, Suratobi knew the two types of clone he had mentioned to the boy, but he couldn't teach them to Naruto. He knew that sooner or later, the boys would probably copy the Mizubunshin from Kakashi or an opponent, as for the Bunshin Suratobi himself had learned the technique as a gift when he first became Hokage, with the understanding that he never write it down or teach it to anyone. 
he wasn't going to break the trust of the elderly Tsuchikaj over a matter as trivial as a technique. As he watched a family finish dinner and joke around, he couldn't help but be proud. The will of fire was clearly evident in this young generation, and it shone on a bright future for Konoha. Anko was exceptionally proud of her sons, however, she also was a bit weary of them. Naruto had never been outside of the village, both for his own safety, there was talk of an organization which was interested in the demon vessels, and because of what he might possibly represent to the village. A weapon of great power. She shuddered every time she thought of her son that way. She had heard rumors of another vessel, from the Wind Country, who had a taste for blood and was about her son's age. She only hoped that they didn't come to the next exam, or there might be a fight of catastrophic size. Sasuke hadn't been outside the village since the massacre. Since he represented the last of a bloodline, his survival was key to the village, letting him go away would be a golden opportunity for assassins from other villages. When they left the village on a mission she didn't know how they would react. Naruto would probably like it, a chance to see something new, learn new techniques, or just meet new people. Sasuke didn't know how he would take it. In the almost three years since he had been living with her, he had changed remarkably. He was lively and energetic, he was obsessive with his training, but Naruto was able to reach him, and she was glad. If he had turned into an Avenger, she didn't know what she would have done. Probably beat him into a pulp. She mused to herself. It was then that she decided to be a part of her son's first mission outside of the village. That way, they would have a familiar face if something were to go wrong. What am I thinking? She mentally berated herself, they have to do a bunch of crappy D-rank missions first. I wonder who will take it the worst. Naruto? Or Sasuke? She couldn't help but smile and snicker at the mental images of her son's faces when they found out that their first 20 or so missions would probably involve weeding some lazy civilian's garden. Thanks for watching my video and make sure to check out the author of this fanfic, link is in the description, see you next time, till then sayonara.